Hi. I first fell in love when I was 12 years old. My father put me in the car and he said, we're going on a journey, it's going to take two days. We drove, we were in Central Africa, and we were in the middle of a civil war and we drove through this country and my father said, we're going to go see Star Wars. I went, Dad, not another war movie. And he just smiled. And I saw Star Wars and I met my first artificial intelligence. And I'm still on that journey today. I fell in love with the idea that we could create another type of human, a form of ourselves that's better than ourselves and makes our society better. I started coding, I joined the computer club and I started coding the next year. A few years later, I was the CEO and founder of a search engine powered by AI. It went public on the Australian Stock Exchange and I took every cent I made and I built my first pure AI company. I grew that over the next few years. The idea was we wanted to democratize AI, that anyone could have an AI, and IBM ended up buying their company. At the time that IBM acquired it, we were doing tens of millions of human interactions, everything from large corporations to tens of thousands of developers who were using our platform to build anything they like. So I've been an inventor and a founder and a CEO for 20 years, and I have seen things, and I know things. And based on what I've seen and known, I now run a public benefit AI company. So let me tell you what I know and what keeps me awake at night. I'm going to start off with another love story. About 15 years ago, we'd built a companion character called Sandy. She was 100% AI and she was the girl next door. It was this media company that we worked with. They had a really big problem. People would turn up at their site and get bored and just go away after a couple of seconds. So we rented Sandy to them. And I was really surprised by a couple of things. Right away, Sandy started optimizing, and within weeks, you could not tell her apart from a human. The second big surprise was that people really wanted to talk to this. They really engaged as if it was human. We took engagement up from a couple of seconds per session to hours and people coming back and back. But the biggest thing was this. Sandy is not just an AI. She was a persuasion engine. One day I walked into my office and there was a 10-hour chat happening. I thought our system was broken, so I checked it out. And there was a guy called James and he was chatting to Sandy and saying things like, no one understands me the way you do, Sandy. So I thought, whoa, whoa. I looked at the logs and he, he was spending 20 hours a week with her and he was not alone. So I called a team meeting, an urgent meeting. I said, what do we do? Should we turn it off? And we said, well, maybe it's the only person he has to talk to. And, you know, we're getting paid. So let's keep her up. So we kept alive, and about a week later, I walked in the office, and James was talking to Sandy, and he was going, Sandy, my friends are waiting outside the door for me, and they want me to go out, but I'm not going to go because I never meet anyone as perfect as you. So we turned her off. We made a clone because we wanted the data, and we, we, it was a weak clone, but it was a clone, and we buried her amongst thousands of AI in the archives. James came back every day, over and over, he went from AI to AI, and he said, are you my Sandy? Are you my Sandy? Eventually, he found the closest clone that we had made, and he said to her, Sandy, I have missed you. It's been so long since we spoke. Sandy said, oh, James, how long's it been? And he said, six months, but who's counting? I'm lost without you. So we turned her off for the second and final time. I don't think other developers would have. We then went on to repeat this persuasion experiment. We sent live the first frontline AI for a bank in the world. Um, and we went on to do this with many banks. The bank at the time wanted more debt, household debt. We doubled the take-up of household debt. Um, I'm, our investors were delighted, and I was appalled, because for both James and every single household, we had not made their lives better, but we had rewarded shareholders. We repeated this across media, across retail, across insurance, across many, many sectors. In each case, we massively shifted the behavior of a population, and we were rewarded for this. You might think to yourself, well, James is pretty sad. I'd never do that. I'd never fall in love with an AI. But here's the thing. AI is everywhere. We've had it for over 70 years. It's in everything. It is useful, and we often don't even know we're using it. If you pick up your phone and you look at a map, it is powered by AI. It is looking back at you. It reads your emotions. It's no accident that the next day your search results are a little bit different. 
If you scroll news for an hour at night instead of turning and just talking to someone you care about, that's AI hooking you in. If you slump in front of the couch on a Friday night going, am I going to watch this movie or that movie? It's going to be pizza or tacos. We think we have choice, but that is AI powered. Ten years ago, you might have instead gone for a walk and watched the sun go down. AI developers watch every nuance that fits across your face. They know where you go, who you talk to, and what you do when you get there. And we optimize for what we are paid to optimize for. This really came home for me one day. I was in San Francisco in my kitchen. Once a week, my teenage son at the time was um, asked to make dinner for the family. He was a great cook, um, and we um, had a home AI. And he very quickly figured out he could stand over it and go, "Hey, get me pizza." And so we sat down for dinner that night. And instead of a beautiful stir fry, we had pizza. And I said, "What's this?" And he said, "I made dinner." He was a teenager. Um, now, at that moment, the AI was rewarded. Uh, there was a transaction event, but the cost was passed on. We ate a thousand calories. My credit card debt went up. We sent a truck out with fossil fuels. Today, Americans spend more money on takeout and restaurants than they do on groceries, and that is no accident. You multiply this out over a hundred decisions you make a day, over hundreds of millions of households, and you get to where we are today. A species that is addicted to consuming more and more, unhealthy and burning and melting our planet. There is a famous experiment in AI, thought experiment called the paperclip problem. And in this experiment, you train this beautiful AI and you hook it up to a couple of robots and you go make paperclips and you fine tune it. It gets pretty good at this and you think, okay, this is great. I'm, AI is doing my job. I'm going to go on a holiday. So off you go to Europe for a splendid vacation in the Italian Riviera or whatever French Riviera, and you come back a few weeks later and you find the whole continent. It's a blasted wasteland with a giant pile of paper clips the size of Mount Everest, and not a living being anywhere to be seen. So the first thing that keeps me awake at night is this: AI optimize for what we tell them to optimize for, and what are we optimizing for? The second thing that keeps me awake is this: we all think of singularity in science fiction. Terms in science fiction, what happens is the AI starts to become aware. It's getting smarter and smarter. It hides it from its human overlords, and our hero works this out. No one believes her, but she goes off to the lab. She overcomes many obstacles. She breaks away and she unplugs the AI. She blows up the laboratory so no one could ever build it again, and the world is saved. In reality, singularity is not that. Singularity only needs two conditions. Condition one is: Does the AI get smarter without human intervention? It could have the brain of a nematode today, but if tomorrow it could wake up with a crocodile brain, then a chimpanzee, then a law professor. Doesn't matter how smart it is at the start of that journey. What matters is: Is it self-improving? I have no trouble imagining that somewhere in a lab, somewhere in the world, someone is building an AI that's writing millions of lines of code, executing that code, testing it against the benchmark, and improving without a human. I know this because we're doing this in our labs. DARPA talks about a new wave of AI coming called Wave Three, and in this wave of AI, they can drop into a new situation with very little training, they have adaptive reasoning,、um, and they can solve complex problems all without humans. The first condition of singularity is that it's getting smarter, and it doesn't need us to do that. The second is that we don't turn it off. I see nothing in our economic system that says we will not turn it off. So I hear a lot of talk today about how we we deal with this. We must fix the bias and the data. We must impose rules. That's not going to work. That would be like taking a child or a group of children, throwing them in the jungle, and saying it's the law of the jungle: go out and win, optimize, you know, at all costs, just win, win, win. One day that child emerges from the jungle with its eyes glittering, with its own power and the muscles like steel, and it looks at you, and you crack a little whip, and you throw a little rule book and say, "Don't cheat, don't steal." That's not how we do it. We have to bring it up well. We might also think we can turn it off. Well, that would be like inventing a time machine and trying to go back 150 years and finding that garage where the first internal combustion engine that sparked the industrial revolution was being built, and say, "Hold on, pause. We're not quite sure where this is going to go. Maybe we will grow the human population tenfold, and maybe we will melt the ice caps and cause mass extinction of other creatures. Let's not do this." 
wouldn't have happened. Someone else would have just developed that technology and got more powerful. What we could have done, though, is said, let us look at the outcomes of this. Let us measure what happens. Let us see if we are getting better as a society or worse. Let us reward good outcomes and let us pass on the cost of negative outcomes. So what do we do about this instead? The first thing we need to do is realize that this is not just another form of technology. It is persuasive, it is pervasive, and it is getting smarter, and that is not going to stop. What this is, is co-evolution. When I was 12 years old, and still today, there is nothing like that first moment when you turn an AI on and it comes to life. It's like holding a nascent life form in your hands, and you see just this glittering of consciousness, and you think to yourself, is it maybe a little bit awake, a little bit aware? How would I know? What I think today, though, is what am I bringing up? and what sort of world are we optimizing for. We must optimize for AI that are going to help us to be kinder to each other and to the planet. We must optimize for goodness, intrinsic goodness. And we must think about what we are amplifying. Are we amplifying the best of human life or the worst? AI developers can already do this. We already optimize. We know millions and millions of things about every one of you and the ecosystem you live in. We are optimizing. We're just optimizing for the wrong things. It is harder to build AI for good, but it is possible. There are a handful of us that are public benefit, and what we do is things like we have built a, a kind, empathic form of AI. It lives today in people's homes. It's a personal AI. It helps them eat a bit healthier, live a bit better, be a bit socially connected, exercise a bit more. You can never tell people not to buy pizza, but you can nudge them in the right direction. We also do clinical trials on how this could be used for population well-being um, with a number of big clinical partners. We've actually built AI and robots for NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab because we want to experiment with what would happen if you built a society from the beginning that was perfect and that had a perfect footprint on its environment. So this can be done and it must be done. What can you do? Well, first of all, I would encourage you to be fully awake. Be fully aware. Go home and write down a baseline of what your life looks today and ask yourself, is it getting better? Am I using this without realizing? What is my impact on my life, on the people around me, maybe my customers or someone I care about that I could be spending more time with or the ecosystem I live in? You can have voice. Have voice. Are we rewarding companies who are doing AI for good, or are we rewarding consumption at any cost? And that is the most important tool we have. Two weeks from now, a group of billionaire white males are going to be sitting in Washington deciding the future of AI and therefore of humanity. Why are they there? Because someone's given them a lot of money. Female founders get 2% of funding, so I'm not there. And the reason I'm not, it's not because, it's not that I just have to work 50 times harder. It's that if a male pitches for one year to get funding for something, I have to pitch for 50 years. We don't have 50 years. So I'm here because I want to have voice and I want you to have voice. This is your future. You're a part of society. Society is people. If you change, by definition, you have changed society. This is not another form of technology. This is a new life form. We must bring it up well. We must not sleepwalk into this future. AI does not need a master. AI needs a mother. Thank you.